Welcome back to the Think Orphan podcast. Thanks again for being a part of the conversation here. Uh, I'm Phil Dark, your host, and Paul Jobson and I love getting to do this. Um, as I've said, as I say, almost every episode, actually, I said it probably every episode. I mean it every episode. And today is no exception. Today, I have with me a confidence. And, um, you know, I always get these these coaches. We're all we're all coaches and we get the the the, the exact titles sometimes, you know, wrong, but I do want to emphasize confidence coach. That's, that's something that's, that's different. So we're going to get into that in a little bit today, a confidence, mental performance coach, also an author podcast host, Shay Haddow here with me. Shay, how you doing? Good, Phil. Happy to be here. So excited to get into it. Yeah. I, I didn't even know I was going to say that about the confidence coach thing, but you know, so that was, uh, you never know what's going to come out here. So there it is. <laughs> emphasis, emphasis always, like always it. gets people right. So, all right. So with that, why don't you just share a little bit with, uh, with our audience, you know, who you are. Some people may already know you or know of you, um, but just briefly share your story, how you developed your passion for soccer, leadership, confidence, and mental yeah. performance and uh, helping girls in particular through their mental health struggles. Yeah. So I grew up, soccer was my life. Also basketball, those two combined. Um, but I've never known a life without it. Um, played at a young age and, you know, was really naturally gifted, had a lot of, you know, God given talent as my parents would tell me. Um, and then when I was 12, I tore my ACL, which at 12 years old is a really hard thing to go through. Yeah. And after that injury, I really started struggling with my confidence. I've kind of had anxiety for a majority of my life too. And that exacerbated it as well. But I went from being this really fast, confident, athletic player to being like full of self-doubt and just so nervous before games, full of anxiety, just hesitating, holding back. And just honestly, I almost, I almost quit just because I wasn't confident. So at age 15, I was like, this close, like so incredibly close to quitting just because I was like, I can't do this anymore. I can't deal with the pressure. I'm not as good as my teammates. Like I don't belong here. Um, and luckily I decided to give it one more go. Um, and I, I ended up getting recruited to play at VCU in Virginia, played there for only a semester and then transferred um, back to my, my home state, Utah state, finished my career there, had a pretty good career, I would say, but still really struggled with the confidence up and down. Um, you know, junior year was, I, I would say kind of my rock bottom year. I had another, another knee surgery and I just wasn't a very good teammate. Um, and I just was blaming everyone for my lack of playing time. And then in between my junior and senior year, I was like, all right, Shay, like you got, you got one more year, like you're done after this. So what are you going to make of it? So I started to like, really think like, okay, is this a physical issue or is this like a mental and emotional issue? So I started diving into, you know, sports psychology a little bit. I took some classes. We had a sports psychologist come and talk to us and work with us a little bit. And it wasn't until I started applying those concepts that I really turned my year around and got voted team captain and had like the best season I've ever had my last year. And I fully attribute it just to me, you know, being more confident and learning how to, you know, improve my mindset and everything. So that's kind of why I do what I do now, because I know that so many girls, whether they're, you know, 10 years old or whether they're college kids, they struggle with confidence, they struggle with anxiety and the, and the mental and emotional health. And there wasn't anything really that I knew of that was addressing that. And so that's why I started doing this is to really help those girls, not just to be more confident players, but more importantly, just to be, you know, confident women. Yeah. You know, and that's why we do this show, right? It's, it's this, the connection between the sports and what we learn in sports and what we learn in, in life and how we can uh, apply the sports to the life. And so I, I love, I love hearing that actually my wife, it's, it's crazy how many of we, we all know this just cause it's out there. If you've spent any time in sports, the amount of knee surgeries, my wife has had four, she played in college as well. Um, and actually she's out in, in DC right now. She was just in Richmond there with VCU oh, cool. and then that's St. John's church right down the street from, uh, yeah. from, uh, VCU, but I didn't ever knew where it was until I went out there and saw, Oh, there's a sign that's, for VCU. There it is. Oh, that's um, awesome. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, and she talked too just about the depression that she went through and, you know, when, when soccer is your identity, which yeah. is healthy, 
Um, yes. How can we help these girls earlier on to realize, you know, what is your true identity? So I, I, with that, I want to just, I, I'm assuming I know, but I don't want to make assumptions. You know what happens when you do. Um, but <laughs> what is your uh, personal why? What's your life purpose? And how are you living that out each day? Yeah, this is such a good question. And I would say a month ago, I would have a different answer. My, I would say in the past, my life purpose was to help teenage girls, right? But now my life purpose is to connect more deeply with myself and get to know myself on the deepest level possible. And in doing that, that's when I can really, really show up for the girls that I serve. And so I'm um, instead of coming from place of just, I'm just going to serve and I'm not going to, you know, focus on me. It's like, I'm going to focus on me first. I'm going to really prioritize my mental and emotional health first. And when I do, that's when I can show up big. So that's my life purpose is just to connect with myself and get to know myself on the deepest level. Yep. Uh, absolutely. And you know, it's funny you say that because the, the coaching the bigger game program, which we just released starts with that. It starts yeah. with the first five modules are just self-leadership because if you're not healthy yourself, you can't give anything to anyone. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we try to have healthy team cultures and oftentimes we, as coaches, we, as leaders are unhealthy and, and well, it kind of, it usually doesn't end well when that's the case. So I, I, yeah, I love that. Love that ability to do that, not just for a self-focus, obviously, but to be able to outflow and have that yeah. pouring out. Because if we're healthy people, we're going to be influencing other people. It just is. Yeah. We're created, to, serve. Right. We're created yeah. to help others. We're created to live mm -hmm. in community. And I think we lose a lot of that, especially here in the United States, where it's very individualistic culture and absolutely and task focused. And, and we, we forget that we're created for community and we're created yes. to work with others to do things. And so the other thing I love about soccer is it helps us remember that we can't do any of this on our own. So love that. Love that. All right. So part of what you've done is wrote a book, right? So yeah. which anybody who's written a book knows it's, it's a, it's a tough thing to do. It's a labor of love in a world full of millions and millions of books, something that we do because we really want to share something with the world. So why did you write you know, she the confident the, again mm -hmm. man you got always like you know confidence coach she the confidence sensing the theme here right <laughs> uh the mindset advantage for female athletes but what 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 uh what was your purpose for writing it and uh what do you hope that everybody that picks it up will be able to get out of it yeah so before the book i i had started the podcast um and it was doing pretty well but i was like i i wanted to find another medium to really get the message out there. And I, I mean, I, I looked up different books, you know, confidence books and that kind of thing for girls. And there was a few, but there wasn't really any specifically for girls in the sports realm talking about confidence and that kind of thing. And so I thought it would be a great way for, you know, teenage girls to consume the information to have like this, essentially this little pocketbook or workbook where they could come back and refer to anytime. And in the book, I, I am really adamant about like, okay, you learn now let's actually take action on the things that you're learning. So after every chapter, there's action steps where, you know, okay, we talk about pregame routine. So now you're actually going to go implement that. Or we talk about, you know, um, having a strong mindset. Now you're going to go implement that by writing down your wins or whatever it is. So that's a big part of it is we're, we're learning, but then we're actually implementing in the book as well. Yeah, and one of the things, obviously, well, it might not be obvious to some, but she the confident. <laughs> one of the things you talk about a lot of in that book is confidence, right? Yeah. And so right. with confidence, which we often talk about in sports is kind of that X factor, right? You see those, you know, not every kid comes into sports confident. My 11 year old, he just turned 11 the other day. He is very confident. I mean, he came out of the womb confident, right? <laughs> um, my other children, my daughter was probably one of the best defenders I've seen at, at her age or throughout the ranks. And she had no confidence. She didn't think she was that good. And, you know, she shut down some of the names that are now in the NWSL and, mm. and that, but she never thought she was good. She'd watch the girls play in other games. And she said, they weren't that good when they played against me. And I said, they, <laughs> they were, but it, you know, yeah. kind of, but just don't get it right. So would you say that, I mean, like we know just intuitively that some probably are more confident, but yeah. is it more nature or nurture in, in your opinion? And for those who, if it, if you think nature, um, how can we, and I know there are some who, whether they are or not, they, they yeah. think they were not born confident. How can they develop their confidence? 
Yeah. So if I had to say, is it more nature or nurture? I think it's a little bit of both, but I think it's more nurture. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of times we feel that confidence is a personality trait. And yes, I do agree that part of it is personality and some people may have to work harder at it, but I believe that confidence is more so of a skill than a personality trait. Mm -hmm. Um, and so let's say that, yes, I do believe there's even men I've had, um, I did, I had a speaking engagement just recently in Napa And I had a mom come up to me and ask me about her four-year-old that's struggling with confidence. And so I think, yes, it can be part of the personality and like it can be harder, but I don't think that someone that isn't born confident can't become confident. So I think it just, it just is sometimes harder for people to become more confident and some people it's more of a natural thing. Um, So I guess a little bit of both. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, yeah. and on that, and I'll, I, I do want you to get into, okay, how can we develop yeah. the confidence? Because you do talk a lot about that. Yeah. But before that, I, I, yeah. I wanted to get your thoughts on those who are born confident, right? Uh-huh. Quote unquote. And I will put that in quotes because sometimes yeah. it's born diluted, right? Yeah. So it's, there's a lot of delusion in our sports too, where these kids think they're a lot better than they are. And you kind of need to you know, what, what's your thoughts on that? As far as, you know, we always joke with my 11 year old, same 11 year old. Um, sometimes we need to knock them down a little bit, right? Like, Hey, you know, you're not quite as good as you think you are. <laughs> you're, not, yeah. you're not at that level yet. You're not going, no premier league scouts are coming at knocking at your door yet, buddy. Um, yeah, yeah. but, uh, what are your thoughts on that? As far as that goes and how can we do that in a healthy way? If that's in fact something that we need to do. I think that that can work decent for boys but for girls I don't really think that diluting it is very helpful because girls really take in Mm. everything that people say and sometimes like they totally skew it but I think for boys and, and coaches too like they'll try to motivate boys by saying come on, like more of the negative, like, what are you doing? Let's go. Like, this is not good. The other team's kicking your butt, whatever. And that's like, oh, boys are like, oh, let's like motivates them. Right. I don't know why I growled, but Hey, it works. Hey, whatever. Um, and then for girls, if they were to hear that same thing, it would just like really bring them Mm -hmm. down. And so I think for boys, it can work to kind of bring them back down to planet earth a little bit. But for most girls and where you can't say all girls, because sure. everyone is different. Right. Yeah. But for most girls, I don't think diluting it would be very helpful. Yeah. Yeah. So what would you say for someone who you feel is like, whether it's arrogant or just really they're they think they're a lot better than they are. So their confidence level is higher on the, yeah. on the girl side. What would you do with that? I mean, here's my take on, um, could we say that arrogance and cockiness is similar? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Let's uh, use those words interchangeably. So let's say cockiness slash arrogance versus confidence. I believe that, um, arrogance is kind of like this fake confidence that it, they're, they're, they're kind of putting up a facade of like, Hey, I'm confident, but on the inside, like really deep down, there's something in there where it's like, I don't actually feel confident. So I just have to fake mm-hmm. and like externally project that I am confident. So I think that's a big difference. Like cockiness is like kind of a fake thing. Um, that's just like putting on a show. Whereas like real confidence, like you don't feel like you have to like show other people that you're confident because you know, you're confident in yourself. Yeah. So that's how I see those two. Absolutely. No, I totally, totally get you're saying that. I, my daughter, when she was in high school, she'd, she'd be like, but they're so confident. And I, and I said to her, I said, well, the reality is it's almost a reverse, you know, corollary where, where the more confident you are, the more insecure you are. Like the more you externally appear confident. Yes. Right? yes yeah. And that's what I meant by that. that like coughing, that conk, it often does come out as cocky. It often yes. does come out as seemingly arrogant. And oftentimes that is a, actually very proportionate to your insecurity but it doesn't appear that way they appear to be the most secure but i go i guarantee if you went to their house and their heart of hearts they'd probably (laughs) be in their rooms crying just as much as anybody else you know it's the same too i think it's the same kind of concept with like bullies like bullies they appear like macho Mm -hmm. confident but really like they're the ones that are hurting the most so i think it's kind of similar with that situation All right. So how do we take that both from those who are cocky, arrogant, and those who are, Mm -hmm. you know, appear insecure and are not confident and are not really healthy in, in understanding who they are? How do we, how do we instill that confidence and help them to develop the confidence in themselves? 
Yeah. I mean, there's so many things, but uh, I'll share a few that have helped me just confidence in general as an athlete. And just as a person, um, I know that if there's any players listening, they're going to roll their eyes at this one because <laughs> I don't want to do it. But the first one is like, like really working on your inner insecurities by meditating, by journaling, by like self-reflection, right? So you can do self-reflection many different ways. I personally do it via meditation. Um, so that's really like getting to know yourself on a deeper level so that you can like, look at, you know, why you're feeling the way that you're feeling kind of getting in touch with those deep insecurities and then taking action on those. So number two is like really, taking action and getting outside of your comfort zone, right? If, if you live a life of always just tiptoeing around and, and let's use the playing example, if you just play well enough to where you're not making mistakes, but you're not really making an impact, like you can't really be confident. If you are going out there and you're making mistakes and you're getting better, because the only way to get better is by pushing the boundaries, making mistakes, stuff like that, then that builds confidence by doing difficult things right? If you never do difficult things, it's like, well, I don't believe that I can do this because I can't do hard things. But if you push yourself and you do hard things, it's like, it just builds up this, this trust and this credibility with yourself that like, Hey, I'm capable of doing hard things that may not be pretty all the time, but I'm capable of failing and bouncing back. And I'm capable of learning from mistakes. So I think those are two things that aren't easy, like the self-reflection and the, Hey, making mistakes. And can you bounce back from them? But I think those are kind of two kind of cornerstones in order to build confidence. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about on the show how most of the great things in life come on just the other side of comfortable. Yeah, right. And, you know, and so if we stay in our comfort zone and we're not, you know, confident in who we are and what how we yeah. play and whatever it is, yeah, then it's not going to be something that you're going to get there just by going through the motions and doing the things that you've always been able to do. Well, um, right. it's like learning, uh, you know, yeah. to be able to kick with the opposite foot, right? Like, right. That doesn't just happen, right? You got to work at it. It's awkward. And it, and honestly, even when you're good at it, when you think about it, it's usually really awkward, you know, even if you, <laughs> yes. you know, when you think yeah. about using your opposite foot, it, because it's got to become muscle memory and that's usually fine. Right. But that's what I think this confidence too. It becomes that muscle memory when you work at it, when you yeah. practice, when you're able to do it, it really isn't a, it's not an arrogance. It's just a, I know I can do this. Yeah. And, and, and another huge thing too, is like confidence isn't like knowing like, oh, I can do this. Like, and that kind of that arrogance, but it's honestly, I believe that it's like just having the willingness to try something and to fail. Like mm -hmm. if you're really confident, you're like, I'm going to try this and I might fail, but that's okay. Right. Like that's a, a good measure of like real confidence right there. Yeah, no, for sure. That's something that, that willingness to fail, failing forward, yes. right? That idea yep. to, and that honestly for coaches out there, that's something that if you want your players to be confident, you have to have a culture where there is a freedom to fail. Totally. If you don't have that, then you're going to, you're going to be knocking people down regularly. Um, so yeah, absolutely. All right. So on that note with leadership, so this idea of confidence, a lot of times, you know, players say, I'm not a leader, but what I'll say to every, every player, whoever they are is everyone is leading someone, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not, everybody is leading someone. And so one of the quotes I love from your, from your book, it's, I guess it's an Abby Wambach quote, but it says, if yeah. you're not a leader on the bench, don't call yourself a leader on the field. You're either a leader everywhere or nowhere. And the reality is like everyone is, like I said, so what are your thoughts on that? You know, as far as just the different types of leaders speak to leadership with all the players, all the girls in this case, since that's what you're, you're focusing on and what that looks like, because as we said, there are people who people say, oh, you're a born leader, but yeah. I don't, I don't agree with that statement either. Cause that's usually just the loud people who everyone looks at and says, oh, you're telling people what to do, but that's not leadership. Yeah. So can you speak to that? And what, first of all, how do you define leadership and then go from there as far as how, when we say everyone needs to be a leader, what that different types of leadership looks like on the field, off the field, on the bench, you know, and everywhere else. How do I define leadership? That's a really good question. And if I thought about it, I might come up with a better definition, but for me, it's like, having the ability to move people to a common goal. Like if just real simply, right. Having the ability to move and inspire people towards a common goal. 
Um, and I, what you were saying about, oh, if you're a born leader, it's usually the loud people. And I think, I think still, like when we talk about leadership, I think a lot of times, you know, girls and teams and stuff, they assume that the loudest, most extroverted girl on the team should be the team captain. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's like that, like maybe, but like, that's not always the case just because you're loud and extroverted doesn't mean that you're a good leader. And just because you're quiet and introverted doesn't mean that you're a bad leader, right? There's so many different kinds of, of leaders. And I think if we we're talking about leadership, we really need to address titles because there's so many times where you have a group of girls or a team of whatever, and there's, let's say there's two captains on the team and I'll have a conversation with someone that's not a captain and, you know, I'll ask them to go address something with the team. They're like, I can, I'm not a, I'm not a captain. I'm not a leader. I'm like, who says just cause it's not your title right. doesn't mean that you're not a leader. Right. So like titles, it's like a title doesn't make you a leader, your actions, how you treat people. That is what makes you a leader, not like some, you know, armband or whatever it is. So it's like everybody, I love how you said everybody is a leader to somebody. And really, like, if you're like, I'm really not a leader to anybody, you're a leader to yourself, right? Going back to self-leadership. So number one, yes, you have to lead yourself. Number two, like, that's, that's, that's the most important thing. If you can't lead yourself, how can you expect other people to follow you? Um, and if we're talking in terms of teams, I think it's so important to have a leadership team or, you know, a, 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 the captains to be different leaders. Cause if you have all these extroverted loud leaders, then like some players aren't going to resonate with that. And sometimes like they're not going to be listening correctly. And, and I think listening is one of the biggest traits of good leadership. So I think it's really important, like for coaches listening, when you're trying to pick team captains or whatever, like pick, pick some that are maybe the loud, like vocal leaders, and then some that are more of your quiet reserve, like I'm just going to put my head down and put in the work kind of leaders. And my senior year, like we had three of them, three of the captains, I was more of the not super vocal, like a little bit, but more of just like, I'm just going to put in the work. And then the other ones were the ones who were going to address things and confrontation and like all that kind of stuff. So I think it's so important that you don't just have one type of leader in your team or in your organization. And also for the, for the, you know, the, the people, the, the teammates that aren't the leaders, so-called leaders is like really not like not believing that you can't also step into a leadership mm -hmm. role just because you're not a leader or a so-called leader. Absolutely. You know, that's something I, told my daughter throughout her youth well she's she's only 13 but the last four or five uh -huh. years you know she wasn't captain a few of the years and she was bummed out and I said doesn't mean you're not a leader yes of course you're a leader you know now she's captain and I say that doesn't change anything you still lead you know the same way you always have when you didn't have the band on you know because that's right. it's who you are and she knew that she gets it and it which is really really cool at, to be able to learn that lesson you know at 13 through the game is what I absolutely love seeing with her. But I know with our, with our team, you talked about that, the importance of having different personality styles yeah. on the leadership team. And that's what we do with the high school team at Folsom high, where, where I coach in is we have those, that leadership team. And we purposefully have the different personality styles represented on there this year, two of our, I mean, they were the captains. The, the only reason they were captains because they went to midfield at, you know, at the beginning of the game, <laughs> right. um, but we didn't even have the title. Um, but what you find is the people who want to go to midfield are the outgoing ones. Totally. Yeah. Unless you tell the reserved ones to go, they won't go. Yes. So we didn't even have armbands. We didn't have anything. I don't, you know, the referees, I guess, wrote the number down, whatever. But that was something that was so important to us. And some people asked, Hey, can I go to midfield? We're like, sure. You know, whatever, if you want to go, go. Um, but you guys decide amongst yourselves who's going and who's going yeah. to be the one kind of representing the team today. But you see in the teams, the girls that people want to follow. And those are the, yeah. the those are the leaders, right? Whether yeah. they call themselves that, whether you call them that, whatever. And there's also the ones who are just quietly doing their job yep. every day. We had some players that never played. They never even sniffed yeah. the field. Mm -hmm. And they led by coming to every single practice and giving their all. They just, they wanted to be a part of that team. And that was to me, I and mean, that led me too. that, that inspired me yeah. to be like, man, this is so cool 
to see that because I would have been the guy. I can't remember playing, man. I don't know yes. if I can handle this. I don't know if I want to play. <laughs> right. Um, so that was something that I love what you were just talking about there. And I think it's so important for us to instill into our teams and to, I think, often actually express it as coaches, as mm-hmm. leaders of the, of the, of the players to be able to encourage that in them so that those reserve people understand that you're always leading people with that yeah. work ethic. If you're coming out and working really, really hard. And oftentimes that's the way it is. The reserve people are the ones who are going to work that and yeah. go that extra mile and do that extra thing. And they're never going to talk about it. And so to be able to encourage them to speak up when necessary but also just keep doing that and you will lead and you are a leader in that. So what are your thoughts on all that? I love that because it really is about the the actions. It's way more about the actions and what the leader actually does than what the leader says. Also, it's really important how the leader says something more so than, than what they say, but how they say it. Um, and one thing I wanted to hit on the, the captain's thing, and you can probably, you know, relate to this too, is on, on girls teams, honestly, most of the time there's clicks on a girl's teams, mm-hmm. boys teams. I'm not so sure, but girls teams, there's, there's always clicks for the most part. And so a lot of times I see, um, coaches and, and stuff select captains that they're all a part of one click. And a lot of times the coach doesn't know that like the coach isn't always aware of the clicks and the divisions of the groups and the team. But I think it's so important to make sure that your, your captains are not just from one click because then everybody else feels unheard and unseen. And it's just like this one click is like getting everything. Um, so I think that's huge, but first you have to be aware of, are there clicks on my team? And if so, what are the clicks? And then we have to divert, diversify a little bit. Yeah. That's why studying your players, studying <laughs> yes. your team is so important and getting to yeah. know them and some levels, it's a lot easier to do that than others. It's hard when you're just coming in and you yeah. get them for a couple hours and you're doing practice plans and so on. Um, but yeah, and I th- I'd say, you know, come up with ways to figure out what those clicks are to break down the clicks as much as possible, bonding events, things like that, that can help with that. But do you have any other thoughts on how to identify and kind of break up clicks at least during practices and during games and during while they're part of the team? Well, one thing, and I'll, I'll get to, you know, during the things in a minute, but I'm working with a high school team in Colorado right now. And I didn't even think about it in terms of, you know, clicks and stuff, but I sent out a a survey where they sent it back to me anonymously and shared, you know, what's going right, what's not going right. And a lot of them were talking about clicks and talking about the communication and the division of the team. And so just doing that, like doing a, a sending out a, I'd send out like a Google form where it was anonymous. So I don't know who said what, but like, now I know that, okay, that's a problem that's in the team that maybe the coach knows, but maybe the coach doesn't. So that's something that you can do to kind of get a gauge of where my team is at as far as that goes. Um, but in practices, I mean, one of the really simple things, once you know, like where the clicks are and who's a part of what is like forcing people to warm up with other people, forcing different teams. And you'll always see the girls standing next to each other, like put us, put us together. And then when you don't put them together, they get all upset and everything, but really just like forcing the, the team to like work with other people. And then off of the field is probably, I would say the most important part, um, you know, putting together team dinners or going out to the movies or bowling, I mean, actually movies, isn't so good. Cause then they don't talk, <laughs> but like doing, doing stuff outside mm-hmm. of practice is huge. Like all of the teams I was a part of, I was so blessed to have such amazing, amazing teams. Um, we did stuff like together all the time and not just a few clicky people, like not inviting everybody, but like the whole team was invited. And that was, I think the thing that helped our team chemistry the most. Yeah, absolutely. No. And I, I, I totally agree with all that. And I know that that's even like when we do vitamins with our team, Yeah, you do one and then you, one side of the line just steps down one spot and, and then they're, and what's cool is you watch them, they're all talking, they're all laughing, they're all having a blast. And and so it just, it's, it's all part of that, developing that culture and just to let them know, Hey, you're part of a team. We got to be a unit. We got to be one. So if you don't like someone, get over it and yep. figure it out, you know? <laughs> yeah. and so, so, and hopefully that can happen, you know, it doesn't always happen and there are toxic teams. And so, but right. how can we, uh, teach them that, you know, in life, you're going to be working in teams. And so how can you figure out how to work together 
and and hopefully like it because it's a whole lot better when you actually work past yeah. issues that you have with each other. All right. So um, one of the other things that you talk about in the book, and this is something that I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on why you think this is, but um, there's a quote that says, according to research conducted by Ernst & Young, 94% of women who hold C-suite level positions, so that's CEOs, CFOs, COOs, um, and, and other C-level uh, positions are former athletes. Of those, 52% played sports at the collegiate level. This speaks to the importance of why playing sports and developing leadership skills now is so important. Why do you think that is? Um, just those numbers. I mean, that's it's astonishing. Crazy. That's I astonishing. Know. And that was, I think if it was like back, that was in the early, like in the mid, like 2008 or something, if I remember correctly, but mm -hmm. still, I imagine it's very similar today as well. But what, what do you think that is? Yeah. I mean, if I had to just, you know, take some educated wax <laughs> at it, I would say number one is the leadership thing. Like sports teaches you leadership, whether it's learning how to be a leader, learning how to be a great listener, whatever it is. So I think that is a big part of it, but also just like the work ethic and like being, having a drive to get better at something and, and being able to bounce back from losses and failures and, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then another thing too, is being able to work with lots of different types of people, right. Mm -hmm. And your, in your career, you have, you know, five, 10 coaches, right? Like you have a bunch of different coaches. And so you learn how to work with different coaches, but then also you have, you know, probably hundreds of different teammates that you work with throughout your career. And so it's really like they, you have to learn how to work with other people, cooperate with other people, um, handle issues and conflicts with other people. So I think it really is like, I mean, a team is essentially like a mini company, a mini organization, yep. Right. So it really Absolutely. is just like practice and how to be a good teammate and how to work towards something and have that drive to, to really get better at something and have the drive to, you know, like, you know, make something of yourself and, and just accomplish things and yeah. And just better yourself. Yeah. I'd agree with that. I know I've, I've talked with many, um, you know, high level positions in different companies, different organizations, and just my, my experience in law firms and in, in running a nonprofit and hiring people who have played sports and others who have yeah. not played team sports in particular. And the differences are, you know, it's, it's very, very noticeable to see, you know, just because exactly what you just talked about, that understanding what it is to play in a team, what it is to know your role, what it is to work really hard to, if you're not starting to start, you know, to push through that no, to push you through that negative experience. And, you know, particularly when it comes to um, females in the, in the business world, it's, it's, you got to push through a lot of junk. Yeah. It's yeah. just the reality. There are, you know, not all, not all companies are, yeah. you know, make it more difficult. Um, but there definitely are men who are like, you got to be better as, yeah. a, as a female. Mm -hmm. There, there absolutely are some. And, you know, to say every, like you said earlier, it's not every, it's probably, I, I don't even know if it's a majority. It probably right. isn't, but there are some loud ones who are obnoxious about it. And, and yeah, and there are some pay differences and there are some other things that, mm -hmm. that there's a lot of issues behind that. So we don't have time to get into all those reasons <laughs> right. on this podcast. And I know, I mean, there's, there's a million of them. So, um, but I think that persistence, that confidence that we talked about earlier, that leadership, that ability to, you know, when someone says no, to not be done, to not be crushed by that. Yeah. And you learn that and you learn that in sports, you learn that in soccer. So yeah. Um, yeah, I just wanted to chat for that for, for a few minutes, but all right. So um, you're writing another book. Uh, what is that? Uh, kind of like I asked before, what's that? What is that book? And why are you writing? You know, some people just write one book and they're like, that is too much work. I don't want to want to do it again. <laughs> Yeah, I'm in that camp. Yeah. Um, that's why I'm doing so many <laughs> podcasts. Um, but you kind of went the other actually. You started with the podcast and then now I you're did. going to books. So yeah. um, what is this new book and and uh what why'd you write it and when are we gonna be able to pick it up? I have no idea when you're gonna be able to pick it up because I haven't started writing it yet. Oh, I thought you had written it. Oh man, no, nope. okay. Okay. Um, I know what it's gonna be about. Yes. I have okay. the the theme, the not the title, but I, I know what it's gonna be about. Um, it's going to be 
still for, you know, female athletes, teenage mm-hmm. athletes, but more so on the emotional side of things, talking about mental health a lot, talking about, okay, we got the mind, we got the body, like the action. And then we also have, you know, the social issues. I didn't go very deep into like, you know, social comparison and pressure, that kind of stuff mm-hmm. in the first book. So going deep into that and then emotional stuff. So the mental yeah. health, how to deal with negative emotions, how to just deal with the, the things, the, all the not so fun stuff of being a teenage girl. And this book, I know like that this book is going to be so much, um, I don't know if harder is the right word, but so much harder to write just because I think with my second book, I've, I've gotten so much more practice with this work. And I think I'm going to be a little bit more of a, not a perfectionist. Cause I'm not a perfectionist at all, but I'm going to want it to like go really deep. Whereas the first book, it just kind of like flowed out of me and it was like a pretty easy, write. Um, but the second book like is going to be a lot deeper is going to require a lot more from me. So I honestly, um, my goal is to start writing it this year within the next few months, but I'm not putting deadlines on it yet. <laughs> I don't, I don't want to force it. Like I want yeah. it to, I want it to really be able to, you know, come from my heart and not just my head. Um, and so, yeah, we'll, I'll let you know when it's, yeah. when it's ready. We'll get you back on. We'll get you back on when, <laughs> yeah. when, 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 after you've written it and then, awesome. uh, and we'll, uh, we'll talk about that too, but I do awesome. want to chat a little bit about what you talked about there. I mean, yeah. it is, well, this will air during mental health awareness month, which is yeah. May. And mm-hmm. if you didn't know that, that's why we're doing, we're going to be doing a series. We're going to have Brad Miller back on. Um, we may have already released by now. I'm not exactly sure when each are going to release, but, yeah. um, but this, the mental health struggles, the anxiety, the, the emotional side of the game that, you know, that emotional, mental, uh, psychosocial side of the game and side of our lives is, is becoming, you know, really coming to the forefront, unfortunately, because of a lot of yeah. negative things that are going on in our society. Right. So, um, and especially, I mean, it's even been, it was well before COVID, but with COVID, it's been just like mm-hmm. exacerbated to another level. But can you speak to just those um, you know, and we can bring in social media, whatever the yeah. idea of comparison is the thief of joy, which mm-hmm. is absolutely true. Mm-hmm. Um, but what, what do you think is this cauldron that has happened? First of all, what is the root of that in your opinion? And mm-hmm. how can we, how can we really address it? Um, in, in a healthy way, I mean, obviously everyone's different, but what are some yeah. things, what are some tools that, that we can use and in, in from what you've learned and what you're coaching as you're working through yeah. with these female athletes in particular? Yeah. I mean, I don't know if I could say like, there's one route. I think it's kind of a combination of a bunch of stuff. So with COVID obviously it's just like the uncertainty, like uncertainty causes anxiety, um, especially for kids being taken away from their friends and their structures and their sports, I think was a a huge part of it, not knowing when they're going to be able to go play again and not knowing, you know, when they can go hang out with their friends and stuff, I think is a big part of it. And then with that, now that they're, they weren't playing and weren't going to school, what are they doing more of now as they're on social media? Now Mm -hmm. they're probably moving less, you know, they're more just at home on their devices. And so I think, you know, a combination of those things in particular around COVID was a huge kind of root cause of the, you know, spike in, you know, anxiety and depression that we saw. And with social media, it's just like, oh, we could have a whole episode on this, I'm sure. But yeah, for me, even personally, like I, I delete social media four days out of the week. So I'm only on Mm -hmm. social media three days out of the week because I just feel better that way. I'm yeah. not, I'm like able to do more of what I love and I'm not comparing myself. And like, people may look at me and be like, oh, she doesn't compare herself. Yes, I do. Literally <laughs> yesterday right. I was comparing myself and I got angry and I deleted social media after that. <laughs> and so like, it's still for, for everybody. Um, yeah. it's a huge, like you said, it's a thief of joy. Um, so social media is a big part of it. So if we're talking about, ways to help with anxiety and, you know, depression and stuff like that, we could, you know, hit those three things on the head. So number one is don't let social media use you. So have some boundaries around social media use. And in order to have boundaries around it, you first have to be aware of how it affects you 
what part of it affects you. Um, you know, what stuff that you're looking at is like, Ooh, I don't feel so good about that. So really paying attention to how you feel. And so for me, I took a fairly drastic measure and that's what I do. I've been doing it for probably a month, but I would encourage, you know, girls listening or whatever, like even before games can be a big thing, just mm-hmm. deleting your social media, you know, a couple hours before your game can be huge. And, you know, maybe it's setting limits, maybe it's taking a one day off of social media, whatever it is, but that can be a massive help to anxiety. Another thing, honestly, very simple is just moving. Like I've read some studies and stuff um, and listened to podcasts that say like for anxiety, like just moving and exercise is way more helpful than taking medication. Yep. Right. So moving, getting outside, being in the sun, being in nature, like these are things that are free that anybody can do that I promise you will have a huge impact on your anxiety. And then if I was to say one more, that's completely changed my life. In addition to those two is just leaving room for silence, whether that's meditation, Mm -hmm. some sort of self-reflection, it could be breath work, whatever it is, is just like getting rid of the devices, shutting down all the noise and just really tuning in to just like the silence around you, I think can be really huge to kind of, you know, deregulate our crazy nervous systems. And you can combine all three by going yes. for a walk without yes. your phone going, yes, and without headphones and just listening. Yes. I did that. So yesterday I was in the kitchen uh, scrolling on my phone and I started to compare myself. I deleted it. And then I went for a walk with my dog. I left my phone. Usually I'll listen to a podcast yeah. when I walk, but I left my phone. I was like, I just need to like be, I just need to kind of just not have anything coming in right now. So yeah, walking is like massive. And it's going to sound like I'm doing all these things right now because, of what <laughs> I, but literally this morning, not no joke, like two and a half hours ago before this interview, I just got the freedom app, which oh, I had yes, before I have mm-hmm. and you can set, you know, hours to be able to just completely be kicked off of all different social media and other apps. I mean, even iMessage and FaceTime and it won't even let you do it. Now Everything. you can always click it off, but you know, it's another helper. Right. And I'm not being sponsored by, you know, freedom app. I wish I were, <laughs> but, um, you know, that, and I literally went for a walk this morning and took my headphones out, put my phone in my pocket and just went and yeah. just, and just listened and just walked. And to be able to just do that is it's so re- it's, it's just relieving. It's like release yeah. of all this pressure from society around you and news and just the negatives of that are out there. There's so much noise that's trying to get our attention and to be able to say, okay, I'm just going to center, you know, if, if you're a Christian like me, you can center Mm -hmm. on scripture. You can center on whatever it is. If you're, if you're not find that, whatever it is that you can just be able to say, okay, I just need to really just quiet my mind because we are, bombarded with junk and noise. And most of it's trying to tell us that we're not enough. Uh, most yeah, of it's trying to tell it. us that we mm-hmm. we're, we, we need more. All advertising is about, you need more, you need this more thing. And so yep. love what you, what you just talked about there. And, and I totally agree with that. Any other thoughts on what I just talked about there? I mean, seriously, like those three things, let's say being outside walking, getting off social media, Um, and being, you know, in silence, those three things literally will change your life. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't say that lightly. Like those are three things that for me, they're absolute non-negotiables that not just, not just going to help you like, you know, be more calm and help with anxiety, but they're going to help you be more confident because you're more clear headed. You're more like connected with yourself instead of always being plugged in to what other people are doing. Yeah. And just a couple episodes ago, I believe it'll be a couple episodes ago when I release this, um, Dr. O'Neill, Dan O'Neill, who wrote Survival of the Fit, talks about that. He has the mm. actual studies and he talks about the studies on that with the lack of exercise actually has led to an increase in mental health issues. Yes, and awesome. so this isn't just something that we're musing about. <laughs> no. It actually has sci- scientific studies that uh, actually support it. So, all right. Now let's get into the, some of the stuff that we we talk about with uh, with our guests here. But what are some of the lessons you know you've learned directly? We've talked about some of this, but just directly from playing soccer um, or getting injured, you can talk about that too. But how have you used them in your various jobs um, and uh, your mental health training? What were the the lessons from the actual game itself? 
I would say the biggest lesson that I've learned is that your achievements on the field or in business or whatever it is, don't equal your self-worth. Mm. I used to think that the more better I performed, the more money I made, whatever, the better person I was, the more worthy of a person I was. And that was like a childhood belief that I had because of my sport. And so maybe in a roundabout way, it's really taught me that your achievements and your successes in your sport or your job or whatever it is, they don't reflect your, your self-worth. Um, so I think that's the biggest lesson that I honestly just figured out last year, to be honest. Yeah. And is there any different answer that you'd say there? Um, anything additional that lessons you learned directly from the game that you've applied, you know, and used in your personal relationships outside the game? Oh yeah. I mean, personal relationships. This one is like really, really simple, but with, with, if we were talking about the sport and then relationships, what you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. Mm. Right. If you go in and you, and you play 50%, it's like, Mm. you're not really going to get much out of it. Same thing with a personal relationship, a, you know, coworker, a boss, a romantic relationship, whatever you put into it is what you're going to get out of it. And I think that's a great lesson of sports is like the effort you put in is going to breed those results. Oh, I love that. No one, no one has said that. And I ah, absolutely love that. That is a, go. that is a great one. I love it. <laughs> what you put in, you'll get out. And I, yeah, that's friendships for sure. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you have a few things that you're doing. We've talked about the books, yeah. we've mentioned the podcast, but what's the name of the podcast? Um, and how can people get in touch with you, uh, to and just talk about your podcast, talk about the, the trainings that you have yeah. and the coaching program that you have and just how people get in touch with you yeah. if they're interested in any of it. Yeah. So the podcast is the alpha real confidence podcast. Um, you can find it on Spotify, Apple, and then on my website, which is alpha real confidence. And then my group coaching program, which I work with girls ages 10 to about 16 and, and all sports, we have mostly soccer players, but all sports. And that's the alpha girl collective where we, we meet every single week. We have coaching calls on all of the stuff we talked about today. Each month we have a dedicated mental health chat, which I absolutely love those. And then they also have kind of a self-guided course, um, you know, going through the different pillars of confidence and mindset and, and kind of, you know, the leadership and, and stuff we talked about today as well. So uh, you can find more information there on my uh, website, alpharoconfidence.com. Dot com. All right. All right. Yep. And how have you, how long have you been doing that? First of all, and, and what kind of results have you seen out of it? Yeah. So I've been doing it for about two years and it's, it's evolved and it's changed names, but essentially I've been doing that group coaching for about two years and the results I've seen have like been pretty freaking awesome. Mm. So the coolest thing about it is that number one girls see that they're not alone right? Because a lot of times the hardest thing is like, there's something wrong with me. I'm alone. Like no one else is going through this. But when they get in a group, in a group of other girls that are going through the same thing, it's like, oh my gosh, that's so powerful in and of itself. Um, So I've had girls that like, yes, they'll take more chances and they'll have awesome results on the field. But more than that, like I've had girls who are like before they would like never go outside of their comfort zone with school, but then they're, you know, um, I was going to say trying out, that's not the right word. Um, applying for like, I don't even think applying is the right word, but for like <laughs> class president, right? Yeah. Like, Oh, running there, we go. running, there you running go. for class yeah. president. And like, um, the, I don't even know the name of it, where you have like a pig, like the, the farm thing and like getting, uh, awards yeah. and yeah. getting, getting really cool scholarships. So the coolest thing for me, isn't that they score more goals, although that's great. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just that they're more sure of themselves and more willing to take chances in all areas of their life and able to kind of bounce back from things that don't always go their way. Yeah, absolutely. I, that also is a first that the, the pig reference, um, uh, where they have a pig. (laughs) Well, it could be, uh, future farmers of America. Yes. Future farmers of FFA. Yeah. Ag, ag farm. We call I was going to say farm. IFA, but I'm like, I don't know. They have a pig or something. <laughs> the pig thing. They have a pig. I showed um, you how much I know about it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, in Mission Viejo, California, South Orange County, California, we actually had a farm <laughs> on our campus still there, still there to this day, right That's off cool. I-5 
and there is a farm literally right next to like part of the auto shop as well. It's total old school. It's oh, awesome. Yeah. That's how my so, high school was. So. Yeah, definitely not what you'd expect in the middle of the suburbs of no. LA, but it is there. And, uh, you know, I think they're pretty good at what they're doing. So, yeah. um, all right. The big thing. Cool. Uh, <laughs> So no, confidence in that as well. Uh, no, that's great. I'd love to hear that. That's so encouraging um, to hear. And like you said, to know you're not alone is massive because uh, it does seem like yeah. you're, you're alone when you're going through a lot of these things, especially when you look on social media and you see everyone yes. doing so great, right? right. You know. So, um, but yeah, so, all right, cool. Last question. It's always bittersweet um, to have these last questions, as you know, doing a podcast, you know, you want to go hours and hours. I have yeah. no doubt. Um, but what have you read, watched, or listened to that has impacted your thinking on on how soccer explains life and leadership? Oh man, I I'm a huge huge reader, so I don't know if specific to soccer. That's all right. Um, but some of the stuff that I've listened to and read, I don't know if you're familiar with like impact theory, mm -hmm. uh, like that kind of stuff, like the mindset, the like going after your goals, that kind of stuff, um, and then a lot of like more like emotional and communication type books of like how to, how to be connected with yourself. And then in turn, like be a better leader, be a better, you know, mom, dad, coach, like whatever it is. Those are, those are the things that I really love. And I could look over at my bookcase right now and see a whole bunch of whole bunch of things. Um, one book that I'm just starting to read, which is a classic is man's search for meaning. Mm. Have you read that? I have not. I'm not. Okay. So Victor Frankl, who went who okay. was in the Nazi camps, mm -hmm. um, just like the power mm. of having a purpose, yeah. um, you know, and like having a why with whatever you do. And so I'm a huge, huge reader. Um, I like literally want to make my whole office uh, a library. So maybe one day. Do you actually read books or do you listen to them? Um, mostly read 90% okay. read 10% listen. I just, okay. I can only listen to a certain amount of books. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, I, I, uh, I, I, as people know on this, I usually listen to, to everything, but there's a few books I'm, I'm yeah. reading now cause they aren't on audio, but, um, okay. but, uh, yeah, no, that that's, I've heard a lot about that book. I've never, never actually picked it up. I think I need to though. So, yeah, um, cool. All right. Well, you know, I just really appreciate you uh, taking the time to be a part of this, um, taking and, and really what you're doing. I mean, I have a huge heart I, coaching girls. I see it. I see it all the time. Having three girls. I know I know the I know the drill. I know the the stuff that goes along with just being a kid nowadays. And it's mm -hmm. really hard. So to know folks like you are, are working with them is super encouraging to me. And so thanks for Thank being you. who you are and doing what you do and being on the show. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. All right, folks. Well, what what uh, she did not know is she basically was given an advertisement for coaching the bigger game. Um, talking there at the end about knowing your why, talking about all the you know self awareness and and self care and all these different things. So if if that's an interesting to you as well, you know, go check out coachingthebiggergame.com. Um, for coaches, really just to help you to, to with all the people side of the game side of things, this stuff that we talked about today and a whole lot more. So if you're interested in that, go check that out. WarriorWaySoccer.com is where you can find out all things Warrior Way with Paul and Marcy Jobson and what they're doing there in Waco and, and now all over the country with their consulting and the, and the giving and, and all kinds of other stuff that they're doing. So pretty cool things there. Check that out as well. And as always, we just hope that you're taking what you're learning uh, through this podcast and you are using it to help you be a better parent, a better spouse, a better friend, just a better leader in all that you're doing and that you do continually remind yourself that soccer does explain life and leadership. Thanks a lot. Have a great day.